Is beautiful. We offer our thanks to Mark Smith. Uh, he was the music director at Riverside United Church, a good friend and member here at St. Aidan's Church as well, for bringing us together with the gift of music. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kevin George. I am a priest in the Anglican Diocese of Huron uh, here in the city of London, the fourth city at St. Aidan's Church. And I want to welcome you all and thank you for taking time tonight to tune in uh, to this uh, second interface service now for us in less than a month. Uh, we are uh, overwhelmed with the gratitude and the kind wishes that you've all sent to us after our, uh, our prayers uh, during this time of pandemic and COVID. And the fact that so many of you have expressed uh, a willingness to see more of this and for us to work together more often to be able to bring messages of positivity and hope. Tonight we come together because, uh, like so many cities around our world, we're concerned about racism. We gather tonight uh, because we want to be able to stand in solidarity with those who are declaring that Black Lives Matter. We want to honor uh, the lives of uh, all of those that have been lost to uh, brutality, uh, to violence, uh, and to police violence. We want to be able to speak with one voice tonight uh, on the side of love. We want to acknowledge love as the way forward. We want to be able to listen to the voices that are most affected by racism. And we want to learn. And so we pray tonight that this time together will be a time of learning, of discernment, that listening to uh, those who will speak tonight, our hearts may be changed. And with changed hearts that we might be able to be allies, to be supporters, uh, to stand alongside and to speak up when we need to, to make change lasting and real. There's a new energy in the midst of this that we've never seen before. And so I'm very grateful to my interfaith colleagues across the city and for the support of the city itself for this project to come together tonight uh, in the mayor's office and to uh, our counselor, Ariel Cayabaga from Ward 13 as well. More from them in a bit. Right now, uh, I would be remiss if we didn't begin by acknowledging uh, the lands on which we gather. Brian. Segundo Kogwe, to who should let you get Gwali, Niwakno, Onida Aga, Niwahanjo. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brian Hill, and I'm from the United Nations of the Times, uh, which is just outside of the, the London city boundary. Um, and I'm the Bear Clan. I'm from the Bear Clan of the Longhouse. Uh, society. Um, I've been asked tonight to to give uh, land acknowledgement to uh, the territory that we're on, um, that we occupy at this time. We respectfully acknowledge that the city of London is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, and Attawandaran peoples, who have and have had long-standing relationships with the land and the region. We would like to acknowledge the many long-standing treaty relationships between Indigenous nations and Canada. The City of London recognizes that the, its relationship with the local First Nation communities, which include the United Nation of the Thames, Chippewa, the Thames First Nation, and the Muncie, Delaware Nation. In the region, there are eight other First Nation communities 
and a growing indigenous urban population within the city of London. The city values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and those whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. We acknowledge them and others who care for their land and its past, present, and future steward. Yonko. Thank you, uh, Brian Miigwech. Um, I want to uh, mention that Brian is the uh, president of the board at the Namaran Friendship Center, and we will hear more from Brian uh, in a little while when we all offer our reflections on, our, on how the spirit calls us in the midst of this. Perhaps many of you in the city have uh, heard uh, Ward 13 Councillor Ariel Cuyabaga speak up over these past couple of weeks. It's not easy when you are um, in uh, the midst of, of hurt and oppression to find a voice uh, to articulate that which is happening to you. And Ariel has been incredibly uh, brave to speak up and to let the world know just what it's like for her as a city councillor here in London. Too often we think we don't have this problem here, but her experience and the experience of uh, black, indigenous and people of color in our city says otherwise. So I would like to invite uh, Ariel now to bring a reflection to us on her experience and what she's calling us to at this time. Thank you, uh, Kevin, for having me here. And um, if you do hear some noise, I apologize. I'm hanging out with um, my 10 year old. <laughs> so that's the nature of COVID-19. I, um, I, I'm gonna read off of something I wrote down just to make sure that my comments are focused and I, I do not lose my, the focus. So I joined uh, the interfaith community, not only to lift people in prayer, but to also condemn every and, uh, and any form of racism in our communities. I lift black communities worldwide who are joined together to protest against the injustice, the pain and the generational traumas that they've endured for a long time. But they do this while they're still mourning the recent uh, murders uh, by the police of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ayanna Dior, and many, many more Black people that I cannot list in this moment. We as leaders cannot stand by and we should not remain silent. We must come together in unity and speak out against the injustices that the Black and Indigenous communities have faced over generations. We must unlearn and we must be willing to deconstruct colonialism and the traumas that we've caused to these communities. This has caused a worldwide awakened that is much necessary, that is very late. Many of us have children that are still having to learn about these traumas. So it's about time that even leaders in the faith communities um, begin to speak about this. A lot of these traumas have come through means of religion and means of um, connecting to communities um, through religion. As Jesus said, he, the shepherd went after the one sheep when there was a hundred. He still had 99, but the one sheep that stayed behind, he went for it because that one sheep also mattered. So while everybody is talking about Black Lives Matter, Indigenous Lives Mattering, it's important that people understand why the one sheep matters, why it's important to go after the one sheep, why it's important to still value the life of the one sheep. And that's what we're talking about. That's what the message I bring to you in love and in peace and solidarity and ask you that you continue to stand as leaders and continue to lift up our mothers, our sisters, our brothers, our fathers, our uncles, our aunties that have suffered generations and generations of trauma. Today, I also want to lift up my son's generation and my son who have now had to watch pandemics of COVID-19 the uncertainty of what tomorrow brings, and also the uncertainty of what their lives mean being Black. Thank you for offering me this space to share this um, reflection. And I, I call upon you to continue to talk about the deconstruction of colonialism within the religious faith, um, within your respective religions, and what it means to talk about love um, and to talk about the spirit guiding us and to center uh, around love and not supremacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor 
Kayabaga, as always, you are, artic you are articulate. Uh, your words are always heartfelt. And I think what I think about when I hear you speak and you mention your, your son and that generation that's ahead of us, um, the work now is critical. The decolonization, the, um, the willingness for us to be contrite, to own our own parts in this is critical if we're going to help uh, that generation learn new ways. So thank you for what you've brought tonight. Um, you are a great gift to our community that God has bestowed upon us in your words. So thank you for that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to um, invite uh, uh, Pastor Junior Sorzano. Pastor Junior is the senior pastor at London First Church of the Nazarene, where he's been, I think, for 23 or 24 years. Um, he's a longstanding member of the faith community here. He's a longstanding member in uh, in this community as a person of color who's had to continue to find a voice to speak up for justice. Um, and uh, he's watched this over decades. And now we invite him to come and to share his reflection at this time. Pastor Junior. Thank you, Kevin. And it's really a privilege for me to join this forum and to speak as well. And I greet everyone, indeed, as brothers and sisters here in this beautiful city of London. You know, God called my wife and I and our family here over 24 years ago, indeed. <laughs> and I always joke that we left Toronto and it was like leaving, I don't want to say hell and coming to heaven, <laughs> but I wanted to say that it was coming to a city that we have learned to love and appreciate. And we felt welcome. We felt accepted for who we are. And in the context of where we are today, yes, I have seen so much that has happened. I have identified with some personal experiences myself as being a person of color, but our congregation has always been one of integration, of equality, and you know, Ariel, you know, has been a part of our congregation. She could tell you we celebrate 29 different nationalities here in this congregation, and we see ourselves as the gateway to the city, being, you know, the last church before we enter the downtown core. And we have seen some great things. We have seen many ills as a, that has ever occurred. But you know, over the past 30 years, since I came to North America, first coming to Chicago, then Toronto, and then to London, I observed that many organizations, you know, have sought to condemn racism and, and they vowed to evaluate their practices to ensure that racism has no presence in their organization and in their communities. However, I am intrigued not because I doubt their sincerity and have not seen sincere efforts, but also because much of this strategy appears to be motivated by social pressure, I would say, than moral conviction. You know, in all that I do, as I love our community and I believe in serving the community, that we are servant leaders, and even as I serve in the prison or in the hospital as, chap as a chaplain, and in our community, I believe that I must have moral convictions. And the thing that really gives me a foundation for this is the scripture that is found in Micah 6, 8, in our scriptures, and which reminds us of how important it is that we have such a conviction when it states, he had showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. And to me, that gives us a foundation as we think about what we see in our society and even throughout the world. But we know that in God's eyes, racism is a sin. We understand that, you know, we have to indeed address this. And I know from personal experience that racism is not eradicated by policy changes. As important as these changes are in dealing with racism, they must be accompanied by addressing the prejudices of the heart, because I believe that's where it comes from. You know, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said in his speech, I have a dream. He said these words, we hold that these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that people will overcome injustice and oppression and will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. And we need not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. 
And that is so important. And all of us, as Councillor Ariel stated before, you know, we all bemoan the lives of those who have perished, you know. Whether going back to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself, or George Floyd, or Mahmoud Arbery, or Breonna Taylor, and countless others whose lives were so violently cut short. And we wish that institutional racism and the police violence it gives rise to didn't cause these deaths. And we would say, you know, our desire is that all members of our Black community and other racial communities, other ethnicities, would feel safe enough to move around their communities without fear or without prejudice or without racial bias. But the truth is it does exist. And even in our own personal experience, I want to share this personal you know, story. I remember my son, he was probably about 19, 20 at that time. He was working at the Delta Armories out of the concierge there, and he was working a late shift. And he was coming home one night, driving his vehicle. And as he was coming up Wellington, approaching you know, Grand Air, he turned onto High Street, and he noticed that there was a, a, a police car also following him. He drove along, he didn't think any of the, anything about it. And this police car followed him from, that, from Grand and High Street right up to Baseline and High before they turned on their sirens and pulled him over. It was about just after midnight. And of course, the light flooded on him. Here's a black young man in our city. And the two officers walked up, one on each side, and asked, um, excuse me, you know, where are you coming from? And he said, I'm coming from work. He was dressed in a suit. He actually had his badge still on his suit lapel. And they said, oh, where do you work? And he told him where he worked. Well, why are you now coming this late? He said, well, I just finished my shift and I'm heading home. So they questioned him and he couldn't understand. He said, was I doing something wrong? I, I don't think I was driving over the speed limit. And they pulled him over. Eventually, they gave him a ticket and said, one of your ID lamps are out. And it was interesting that they followed him for over two kilometers before doing this. He came home a very angry young man. And he said, what have I done? What did I do wrong? One of my lights was working, my number plate, and I went to check, was still visible. I said, okay, you just take this, go to the reporting station, make sure you change the bulb, and it's going to be no problem. But I never forgot the pain and hurt it caused him. And I said to him, what you need to do is be bigger and not better. Be better and not better. And not bitter, I mean. And I said, you can help to change things. And thank God he took my advice and he desired to become a police officer. And he ended up being a police officer. Well, he applied here in London, went through the process, but ended up in Edmonton for a while. And then, you know, came back to our city and he has been involved in that. And now he is in the CBSA process. But the point I'm making is we know there is no easy solution to the problems we have faced for centuries, actually. And we also know that we need to devote our time, our energy, and resources towards making a difference. And I believe, and I am thankful that even here in our city, I believe we are committed to driving lasting change through even criminal justice reform. And there must always be equality and justice for all, and also policing, pol policing equity. And we must seek to make racial justice more than just a promise. I believe we are committed to creating a community that treats everyone equally and with dignity. And black lives do matter. As a matter of fact, all lives matter. No matter the color of our skin, our race, our re religious persuasion, we all, my friends, I believe, have the right to celebrate our identities without any prejudice or without bias. And we should never tolerate discrimination, harassment, harassment or racism. And our goal should be to create communities that are, are diverse and inclusive for people of all colors to work and to thrive and to be who God created them to be. You know, 
as I said at the start, I believe Jesus hates racism. And this matter for us, yes, has theological issues, but also has sociological and historical context, but I believe it's also relational. And our being here today demonstrates the need for us to come together as one. You know, in the scriptures, Jesus prayed that we will be one. And that is important. And as that song says, you're my brother, you're my sister, so give me your hand. And I believe as we go forward in our city and throughout our nation and around the world, that we will see us rising together. I always tell people, you know, I came from a small island, Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. I was a place where people of all different races and colors dwell together. And we didn't say, oh, we were, whether we were black or white or Indian or this. We just said we were Trini. And you know, I joke and I tell people I'm a Trin can, because now I'm all Canadian as well. And we can be of one people who celebrate the joy of freedom, of justice, and equality. So that's my reflection today. And I pray that God will continue to bless our city, bless our nation, and bless the world as a whole. That finally, as Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King has said, that this will be an oasis of freedom and of justice. And that, you know, we will be as sisters and brothers, being able to enjoy, you know, the blessings of life that God has given to us. So may I pray at this time. I believe it will be wonderful to say a prayer. Please. So join with me as we pray. Our Father and our God, we come to you today. And we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you that we do recognize that life is precious, but yet life is fragile. And as we bemoan the injustices of life, as many of us were also taken aback to see the killing of George Floyd, to recognize that there seemed to be no concern for life by the police officers who were present. And not only him, but in other cases throughout history, we have seen this. We know, Lord, that the value of life has been a struggle through time. Over 400 years, going back to slavery and to all those ills that, has, that we have experienced in society. We know, I believe, it grieves your heart, oh God. Because we understand that God is a God of love. And you have said that people will know we are your disciples by how we love one another. Father, I pray that you would fill our hearts with love. For where there is anger and hatred, oh God, that there would be a transformation, that people indeed, their hearts will be so transformed that they will learn to love and to forgive and to care one for another, to move from being selfish and to begin thinking and caring for others. Father, we pray that you would help us, that even as we saw our people gather together in our city last, this past Saturday, that as people came in solidarity, Father, to speak and to voice against the injustice that has occurred. Help us, O oh God, to do our part. Help us, O oh Father, to encourage others as we encourage change and transformation in our world today. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your love that compels us to care one for another, to rescue the perishing, and to care for the dying. So bless us, we pray. For I ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Pastor Junior, uh, for your heartfelt words, for your own personal stories, um, and for your willingness to be so open about your own lived experience. And I think about what you said about that change in the heart and... Uh, I have a friend here in, in the city who, uh, who's also expressed that uh, as a person of color himself that uh, what's really needed is for a change in our heart. I, um, as a, a newcomer to London and relatively speaking compared to you, Junior, because you've been here for 23 or four years, I've only been here for eight. Uh, but one of my reflections coming here is that London, I think, is the influence perhaps of our, our excellent learning institutions. We're, we're, we're trapped between our ears here a lot. We think a lot. Uh, but sometimes we need to get in touch with what we feel and, and hold on to those feelings and know that our hearts need to be changed. And so thank you for sharing that with us uh, this evening, Junior. Uh, 
it's really a blessing. Thank you. At this time, I'd invite um, His Worship, um, Mayor Ed Holder, to bring greetings on behalf of the city. Thanks very much. You know, in all my years living in London, I don't recall ever seeing a protest like the one we all experienced recently in downtown London. Some 10,000 people coming together in the midst of a pandemic, no less. All of them there to show support for those who are black, indigenous, people of color. And all of them there to demand the eradication of systemic racism and oppression experienced by individuals in those communities. It was peaceful, it was historic, and it was powerful. Never seen anything like that in London. More important perhaps than what I saw was what I heard. Tonight I heard Councillor Ariel Kayabaga speak of the passion, the pride, the hurt, the anguish, and the urgency. We also heard that in the voices who spoke during the demonstration. And you know, Londoners were listening. I was listening and I am learning. And more important, we're committed to action. What we're working together to eradicate, what we are committed to dismantling is a form of racial oppression that has existed for far too long. Our actions may vary in scope and in size, but they must be consistent and they must be constant. You know, one such action was taken by members of London City Council just recently. The vote I'm proud to say was unanimous. I'd like to read, if I might, the motion to which I'm referring, tabled by Councillor Mohammed Salih, which was my great honor to second that motion. It reads as follows. That the Municipal Council of the Corporation of the City of London acknowledges that, that systemic, anti-black, anti-indigenous, and people of color racism exists in London. That the Municipal Council unequivocally condemns racism in all of its forms. That the Municipal Council acknowledges that the corporation's workforce is not reflective of the population it serves and that it will continue to work to ensure a reflective workforce. That the Municipal Council affirms the commitment to help eradicate anti-black, anti-indigenous, and people of color oppressions. Now therefore it be resolved that the civic administration be directed to report back to a future meeting of the appropriate standing committee with an update on the implementation of the community diversity and inclusion strategy, providing specific details with respect to the equity and inclusion lens of the strategy and the next steps that will be taken to end racism in London. And I wanted to share with you that that motion received unanimous approval from members of London City Council. And I thought it was important that all who are listening tonight be aware of that. Let me be clear, this marks not the end, but rather the, be the beginning of what must be a series of actions to eradicate racism experienced by those who are black, indigenous, and people of color in London, Ontario. Here's my hope that all Londoners remember what we saw and especially what we heard. We must continue to listen and perhaps more importantly, we must act. I count on everyone's commitment as you can count on mine to work with members of London's black, indigenous, people of color communities and all minorities who feel disenfranchised as well as public officials and leaders of institutions around this great city to build a London that reflects on all days, the sense of fairness, justice, and unity we witnessed in Victoria Park. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I think I speak for all of us here when we express our gratitude to you for what you've been doing um, and your willingness to support uh, the uh, protests and demonstrations and the direction that you've been giving and uh, your seconding of that motion. Um, we're blessed with uh, good leadership uh, and we're, we're thankful that you're doing what you're doing. So continue, continue the work. Um, if I could now invite uh, our friend, Dr. Munir al Qasem to uh, bring a, a reflection prayer from the Muslim community. I start with the name of God, the all merciful, the compassionate. 
in 2014, a young man by the name of Eric Garner in New York was killed under similar circumstances to what happened in 2020 when we witnessed over our cell phones the murder of George Floyd. The thing is that both of them, the last words that they uttered before they breathed their last was, I can't breathe. Six years separated these two crimes and we, by our meeting tonight, and through other events like this, we need to make sure that nothing like this will happen after six years or after a year or after we have to put an end to this. Unfortunately, in the middle of the Hudson River in New York, there stands the Statue of Liberty. But that Statue of Liberty doesn't seem to be doing anything to grant liberty, freedom, liberation to the people of the world, to the people of the United States. And I know that in the Quran, in the final scripture to humankind, God tells us that you may see something you dislike, but God will make it a spark for goodness in the future. Now, nobody was able to sleep for many nights. Some still until now could not sleep after seeing what happened in Minneapolis. But look what happened. You know, we know that in 2012, another crime and the victim was Trayvon Martin. And that sparked the BLM, Black Lives Matter. And I know that inspired many movements across the world. We know that there is the RLM, Rohingyan Lives Matter, the ULM, Uyghurs Lives Matter, the PLM, Palestinian Lives Matter, JLM, Jewish Lives Matter, MLM, Muslim Lives Matter. You know what? If I keep on going, I will exhaust all the letters of the alphabet. So suffice to say, HLM, human lives matter. We really need to do something, you know, to speak up, to make sure that racism is finished once and for all. Because all of us, as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, all of us originated from Adam and Eve and both were created out of elements of earth by the same God. There's no difference between a black and a white, as he said, or an Arab or a non-Arab, except in piety and good deeds. And that is why we really need to pray to God. And you know what? If prayer could be plagiarized, I admit I'm going to plagiarize a prayer that touched my heart on May 30th. It was a Saturday. And it was a prayer that was uttered by Rabbi Yael Splansky, a senior rabbi of Holy Blossom Temple, the first Toronto synagogue. And it was a Saturday, and this is what she said. She said, Saturday is the Jewish Sabbath. Normally, it is a day of peace and rest, but not today. Today's unrest prompted me, she said, to turn to this prayer written by Rabbi Mitchell Salem Fisher. And that's the prayer that touched my heart as a Muslim because, you know, these prayers do not recognize religious boundaries. We all originated from the same God. So Rabbi Mitchell Salem Fisher said, God, make us dissatisfied dissatisfied with the peace of ignorance, the quietude which arises from a shunning of the horror, the defeat, the bitterness, and the poverty, both physical and spiritual, of human beings. 
shock us, Adonai. Deny to us the false Shabbat, which gives us the delusions of satisfaction amid a world of war and hatred. Disturb us, O God, and vex us. Let not your Shabbat be a day of torpor and slumber. Let it be a time to be stirred and spurred to action. And then she quoted the Reverend Dr. King, who said that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. I want to believe him. And she said, but I'm not seeing it today. Now, again, she quoted an activist by the name, he was a Holocaust survivor by the name of Eli Weisel, famously said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it is indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it is indifference. If we want to be alive in this world, we cannot be indifferent to the racial injustices which are raging today all over the world. We cannot be silent. This is a good country. This is a beautiful city we are living in. We are blessed to be citizens of London but we shouldn't be so smug or so ignorant or foolish to believe that this is a problem that does not exist in our city. I was in conversation with Muhammad Saleh a few days back talking about this issue of racism and he said that we are witnessing it today right here in London, Ontario, because it's a global village and we have to understand that we really need to recognize racism as a global pandemic. More fatal than COVID-19. And that is why I appreciate us coming together as faith leaders and with one voice of love turning to the Almighty and declaring that we are members of the same family. A black, a white, a yellow, a red. We are members of the same family and we ought to love one another. And I will finish by just saying that when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, returned to the city of Mecca that forced him out after eight years, he walked into the city peacefully on the right he was holding the hand of Bilal the Abyssinian, and on the left he was holding the hand of Suhaib the Roman, a black and a white, and he declared to the people, O humankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female and multiplied you unto nations and tribes so that you may love one another, verily the best among you in the eyes of God is her or him who is most righteous. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. El Qasem. We always appreciate your passion, um, your beautiful willingness to engage across faiths with prayers. And uh, we're most grateful for your words tonight. If I could invite Father Jim Mockler, who is the um, uh, a priest at uh, St. Peter's Basilica from the Diocese of London, the Roman Catholic Diocese of London, to bring his reflection and prayer this time. Thank you, Kevin, and good evening, everyone. In uh, Canada, in London, and in a world of people of different ethnic, language, cultural, religious, and racial heritage, no one part of that world or country or city ever has the right to claim superiority, power, or privilege over another. We have done a very, very good job confronting, confronting the virus that is COVID-19. And we have done it by staying apart, physically distancing. 
we need to eliminate the virus that is racism by doing the opposite, standing shoulder to shoulder each and every day. It's an understatement to say that we have had to deal for a long time with the evil that is racism. The avenue to change, as we have seen in protests, predominantly peaceful and focused as was last Saturday's here in London, is community and solidarity. In supporting the defense of the truth that Black Lives Matter, we as Christians, first of all, have to face our own complicity and our need for racial healing. Our faith and our legacy of well-grounded and profound social teachings calls us to leadership in breaking down barriers and standing always against injustice. To violate human dignity in any way is for us to dishonor the presence of Jesus in our lives. And our work will not be done until African American, women, men, and children, all indigenous persons and persons of color are treated equally in every aspect of life in London and in our country. And so that's why we join and are happy to join with people of all nations to reject violence and racism. We join our prayers with all those as well who are grieving and who are impacted by it. We have to do better. And doing better starts with listening. Listening to the anger and the pain and the trauma that has been caused. We need then to engage in productive dialogue that results in honest, real, and transformational change. We need continuous learning, never thinking we finally have it. We need to end our silence. We need to accompany our young people in their journey to understanding. And so as we reflect regularly on the matter before us in the days ahead, I need to ask, with everything that is happening, what am I hearing? What am I learning? And what am I doing? And so we pray. God of love, reconciliation, and healing, deliver us from the evils of racism in our communities that cause pain, anguish, and division. Deliver us from the evils of active racism, the outspoken language of hate, visible acts of violence, where the clear motive is to divide and destroy us. But also deliver us from the evil of passive racism, the attitudes that allow racism to exist because too many of us say nothing and do nothing to stop active racism. Deliver us from the evil of systemic racism, the biases that have far too long been a part of too many systems, creating disadvantages that remain for generations. Remove from our hearts attitudes of superiority and privilege, from stereotyping and devaluing a culture, Deliver us from racism so that our communities can be renewed by the rejection of all prejudice and all violence with a deep respect for every human person so the healing bonds of solidarity may grow and the common good thrive in London, our province, our country, and our world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Father Jim, for those kind words. This time I'd invite uh, 
Rabbi Deborah Dressler from Temple Israel to bring her prayer and greeting. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'd like to start with a story. A rabbi and a soap maker once went for a walk together. The soap maker ad asked the rabbi, what good is Judaism? After thousands of years of teaching about goodness, truth, justice, and peace, after all the study of Torah and all the fine ideals of the prophets, look at all the trouble and misery in the world. If Judaism is so wonderful and true, why should all this be so? The rabbi said nothing. They continued walking until he noticed a child playing in the gutter. The child was filthy with soot and grime. Look at that child, said the rabbi. You say that soap makes people clean, but see the, the dirt on her? What good is soap? With all the soap in the world, that child is still filthy. I wonder if soap is of any use at all. The soap maker protested and said, but rabbi, soap can't do any good unless it's used. Exactly, cried the rabbi. So it is with Judaism. It isn't effective unless it is applied in daily life and used. Each of our traditions has those important lessons. The question is, is what we're going to do to use them. I'd like to share a reading from Jack Reimer about those values. We cannot merely pray to God to end war, for the world was made in such a way that we must find our own path of peace within ourselves and with our neighbor. We cannot merely pray to God to root out prejudice, for we already have eyes with which to see the good in all people, if we would only use them rightly. We cannot merely pray to God to end starvation, for we already have the resources with which to feed the entire world if we would only use them wisely. We cannot merely pray to God to end despair, for we already have the power to clear away slums and give hope if we would only use our power justly. We cannot merely pray to God to end disease, for we already have great minds with which to search out cures and healings if we would only use them constructively. Therefore, we pray instead for strength, determination and willpower, to do instead of merely to pray, to become instead of merely to wish, that our world may be saved and that our lives may be blessed. This time of year, we're reading um, in our annual Torah cycle from the book of Numbers. And that book in Hebrew is called Bamidbar in the Wilderness. And there's a lot that we can see as a parallel um, with the Israelites' journey. They, they, we begin in Egypt um, under the slavery, the enslavement of the failures of the past at, that continue to the present. And there's a promised land that is our goal, but we are deep in a wilderness and we will only get there through the uncertainty and marching together. We've never been united as this particular assembly. Yet the journey, the difficult, taxing, unknowable journey is our only way forward. Sometimes it is we in our community, each community that needs support. Today, it is we who are being called to act as allies when we say with one voice, Black Lives Matter. In that book of Numbers, we have this famous text, which we call the Priestly Benediction, which says, Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha, may God bless you and keep you. Ya'er Adonai p'nave lecha v'yichunecha, may God's light shine upon you and may God be gracious to you. Isa Adonai p'nave lecha v'yasem lecha shalom, may you feel God's presence always within you and may you know only peace. Like my colleague, Dr. Munir, I'm going to borrow now from another faith tradition. And I think the Franciscans took that idea from the Book of Numbers and put it into a contemporary context for me. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, starvation, and war, 
so that you may reach out with your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Let us all say, Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Dressler. Deborah, you're always uh, so good. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite um, Kirit uh, Kaur uh, to bring greetings and, and thoughts and prayers on behalf of uh, London Sikh community. My name is Gidith God, and I'm an architect and artist here in London, Ontario. And I'm very honored to be a part of this interfaith leaders group in representing the Sikh community of London today. And what I would like to focus on today is the idea of love and oneness that is the foundation of Sikhism. And I'll be sharing bits of sacred scripture from a variety of different authors from the sacred text of Guru Granth Sahib to um, illuminate on this principle. Saj kaho sun leho sabe jin prem kiyo tin hi prab payo. This is the message of love from Guru Gobind Singh Ji, who was the 10th Guru of the Sikhs. And it basically translates to the following. Listen to this truth, O people of the world. Only those who love will be able to attain oneness with the Almighty. In the sacred text of Guru Granth Sahib, the first Guru of the Sikhs, Guru Nanak Dev Ji also says, in this Shabbat or poem, he's saying, if you want to play the game of love, come on my path with your hand in your head, which is symbolic for dropping all pretense, prejudice, and egocentric thoughts. And by game of love, he's referring to understanding the concept of a universal creator who resides in the hearts of all and permeates throughout the creation itself. And Sikhism impresses upon us to realize that we're all metaphorically birds living under the same tree. We're all here together and we should all share the bounties of nature, learning to live cooperatively and care for one another. And just like birds who fly away from the trees when the night ends and the sun rises, we're all here for a very short time. And Guru Nanak, again, the first Guru of the Sikhs teaches us that this world itself is a beautiful garden created by Vaheguru, the universal creator. The earth is our mother, the water, our father, the air, our guru or teacher. So let us be thankful and share what this planet has to offer and respectful and while respecting, sorry, its vegetation and its rivers. God lives in everyone's heart. So let us not break any hearts and spread love around us instead. And so this message that I just spoke about, um, these metaphors of nature, I'll share the same message through some poems or shabbats by different authors in Guru Granth Sahib. Pavan Guru Pani Pita Mata Tart Mahat Div Sarath Doi Dai Daya Kele Sagal Jagat Birkha Hate Sabjant Ikathe Ik Tate Ik Bolan Mithe Ast Udot Paya Utjale Jo Jo Aud Vehania Tarbar Ek Anant Dar Sakha Pohop Patr Ras Paria Ehe Amrit Ki Bardi Hare Tin Harpure Karia Farida Kalak Kalak Mehekalak Vase Rab Mahe Manda Kisno Akia Jantis Bin Koi Nahe. So these messages urge that a Sikh life should revolve around love and care for all humanity. And I hope that we can continue to spread the same love through Gurdnanak's principles of Nam Japana, to meditate on the true Lord's name, Girt Gadmi, honest living through honest work, and third, Vand Ke Chakra, to share before consuming. Nanak Nam Jadvi Kala Tere Pane Sarvatta Pala. In the name of God, we pray for the welfare of all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kirit. Uh, that was wonderful. 
at this time, I would invite um, Brian Hill uh, back to uh, to speak. Brian gave our uh, land acknowledgement at the beginning. Brian is the uh, president of the board at Namorand, and uh, he will bring uh, thoughts and, and greetings and spiritual prayers now on behalf of the Indigenous community. Um, Hello again. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Hill. I'm from uh, United of Nations of the Thames. I'm just outside of London, Ontario. When I was first invited to participate in this uh, in this group, uh, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about uh, because uh, I know of the short time frame um, that we that we do have, and I've been known to. Uh, speak freely and openly <laughs> and long um, but tonight with with what's happening um, in the world today uh, yesterday last week last month um, last year um, as far as back as I can remember you know this there's been incidents like this uh, no matter where you go uh, the one thing that that came to me was uh was the teaching I got uh, from my friends uh, elders in my community who uh, presented me a number of years ago with one of the highest honors that uh, indigenous persons can receive and that was the gift of of this this mm -hmm. eagle feather I'm caretaker of this eagle feather while I'm still in the physical world here. And when I received this feather, I also received the teaching that what this feather represents is our life and our healing and our path. Um, when we are when we are born, we come from the spirit world, which is this end here. We're given we're given everything we need by the Creator, all the knowledge, all the wisdom, all the love, respect, honesty, truth, all those good things that we're given. And we come into this physical world, this natural world here. This is our lifeline, that center, that center rib of this feather. And see, it starts out, it, it's really nice and strong. But as we travel along our life, you see it starts to thin out a bit. It's smaller. But it's still going, it's still straight. There's still a path there. Until such time as the creator calls us back home back to that spirit world and that's at the end here that's where we go on um, through that western door back into that spirit world but our physical bodies stay here but during our travels during our lifetime we we come upon things um, things happen to us uh, willing and unwilling we learn things we see things we're taught to believe things, good and bad, and that's represented by these, by the sides of the, the quilt, and these little pieces here. And as we're going along in our lives, we learn some not too good things that are happening to us, and it disrupts our path, and it pulls us from that path. All through our lives, our childhood, our youth our adolescence and into our adulthood there's distractions there's uh, those other things in uh, the world that that pull us off of this path in the middle and it makes our life kind of rough looking so as we're going along through our lives we see those things and our our our, our lives become something looking like this but we're taught and we're shown <laughs> through our teachings and through our healing ceremonies that we can take care of these things. We can go back and we can look at them and understand them, see them for what they were. But it takes time and energy. And it takes uh, somebody who's willing to do that Somebody who's willing to go back and look at those things and learn 
so that our lives can be manageable again, like this feather that's straightened out. So one of the things that that I got out of that is that, you know, when we're taught something as a as a young person, as a as a as a baby, as a toddler, we're taught things by people around us. We're taught by our parents, we're taught by our siblings, we're taught by our, our, our relatives. And sometimes those things aren't true or aren't are skewed by experience or skewed by um, somebody's understanding. But it's up to us. That's where the healing begins. The healing begins inside us. We make those decisions, we make those choices. When we talk about racism, we talk about uh, discrimination, we talk about all of those things that are out there that affect us every day. It's up to us. We have to heal ourselves first. We have to look at those things and decide and make those decisions and make those choices, whether to believe them or whether not to believe them. But each and every one of us carries that inside of us, our creator, is to put that in us, the love, the respect, the trust, the wisdom, the honesty, the bravery, to look at those things. We look at those things every day. So true, true healing begins with ourselves. And when we, and when we become whole again, and we become healed people, it's like a ripple effect. Like you throw that pebble in the water, you see those, those little ripples go up. That's where the healing comes from. That's where the understanding comes from. That's where the education comes from. Is by sharing those good thoughts and those good words and those good prayers. Um, that's how it begins. Um, and I, I'm trying to be as brief as I can tonight. So um, with that, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, and like to think, you know, say you don't go to uh, Kevin and uh, the rest of the group who, who allowed me to participate tonight. You know that uh, that healing path, we're all on it that healing journey, we're all in the midst of it. I just ask you to look at, look at, look at your own healing, look within yourself and see how you can help those that need that help, need that understanding. Just to, you know, be, be just be people, uh, just be people without uh, designation, I guess, it's to, to put it as, as Briefly as I can. Uh, so again, uh, y'all go to Kevin and, and the group tonight for a long to participate in this, and I hope it. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm not as concerned about the economy of your words as you are, uh, but I want to tell you that every word is weighed with so much wisdom and love. And I thank you for them uh, because they're words we need to hear. I'm deeply conscious as a priest in a church, the Anglican church, which is a sad past, colonial past, and how we've participated in the hurts against our indigenous brothers and sisters of the need to be able to look inside of myself and my own institution for healing. And uh, I appreciate that beautiful image you gave us tonight. Uh, so thank you. Bless you for doing that. Um, at this time, I would invite uh, Renee Phillips, who is a member of the Baha'i Assemblies of London. Thank you. Um, and thank you for mentioning healing. The last time that this, uh, these friends met, we prayed for the difficulties brought upon the world by a physical disease. And today, we gather to end an even more toxic disease afflicting humankind, racism. Racism at the root is at the root of many of the symptoms of discord we witness around us. And like a dangerous virus, it affects nearly every vital system within the body of humankind. Economic, political, educational, environmental, and physical. On a broad scale, it wears away at the systems intended to uphold justice. 
And even at the smallest scale, it harms personal relationships. The citizens of London overwhelmingly believe that all people need to be treated fairly and that the differences between individuals and groups bring beauty and richness to our community, like many people before me have said. But to root out the disease of racism requires more than a belief in the oneness of mankind. Discussion is good and good wishes are good, but they're only a start. They will no more cure the disease of racism than they'll solve the problem of COVID-19. To root out the disease that causes the systemic strife takes putting those beliefs into action at all levels. A central figure of the Baha'i faith said, we cannot bring love and unity to pass merely by talking of it. Knowledge is not enough. Wealth, science, education are good, we know, but we must also work and study to bring to maturity the fruit of knowledge. As this city moves forward from discussion of the symptoms to the hard root work of rooting out the disease, be assured that the Baha'i community of London is working diligently to bring the truth of the oneness of humankind into action at the grassroots alongside you. So on behalf of the Baha'i community of London, I offer this prayer. It was written more than a century ago by a central figure of our faith when he visited the United States. O oh God, thou who art kind, verily certain souls have gathered in this meeting, turning to thee with their heart and spirit. They are seeking the everlasting bounty. They are in need of thine infinite mercy. O oh Lord, remove the veils from their eyes and dispel the darkness of ignorance. Confer upon them the light of knowledge and wisdom. Illumine these contrite hearts with the radiance of the sun of reality. Make these eyes perceptive through the witnessing of the lights of thy sovereignty. Suffer these spirits to rejoice through the great glad tidings and receive these souls into thy supreme kingdom. O Lord, make this assemblage the cause of appraising the standard of the oneness of the world of humanity and confirm these souls so that they may become the promoters of international peace. O Lord, verily the people are veiled and in a state of contention with each other shedding the blood and destroying the possessions of each other. Throughout the world, there is war and conflict. In every direction, there is strife, bloodshed and ferocity. O Lord, guide human souls in order that they may turn away from warfare and battle, that they may become loving and kind to each other and that they may enter into affiliation and serve the oneness and solidarity of humanity. Thou art the Almighty. Thou art the omniscient, thou art the seer. O oh Lord, be compassionate to all. Thank you, Renee, for uh, again reminding us of the need for healing. I would now like to invite uh, Dev Dubey uh, to share his prayer and his thoughts with us uh, from the Hindu community here in London, Ontario. Greetings and namaste to all of you. Um, I bring greetings from the Hindu Cultural Center of London, Ontario, and the wider Hindu community in London environment. I begin with a short prayer, universal prayer for all. Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahavidyam Karavavahai Tejasvinavadhi tamastumam vidveshavahai Om Shanti 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 Om. We pray, O oh God, may all be protected, may all be nourished, may our intellects be sharpened, may we collectively work with great energy, and may there be no animosity among us. Om Peace. Peace, peace. Dear friends, I begin today with a simple verse from, our, from the Hindu scriptures, Vasudeha Kutumbakam, which simply means that the world is one family. 
If we understand this and we believe it and we use it uh, in a purposeful manner, it can help us significantly. If we deny this eternal truth, then our life will be based on insecurity, fear, feelings of inferiority or superiority. When our lives are based or when humanity is defined along these lines, we focus on differences and refuse to accept at a fundamental level that we're nothing else but expressions of the same consciousness. God blew the bread of life into man. It was the same breath that was blown into all man so that you can become a living being. If we can reflect this in our thought process, then the ideas of differences become like the seven colors of the rainbow the celebration of a singular light that is differently expressed. We all need each other as suppliers or purchasers of goods and services. And even at this most mundane level, we can find a common thread of interdependence, which if carefully channeled and understood, can become the basis for love and understanding. We just can't do without each other. That's the way the universe is built today. A failure to do so results in embedded social, economic, political policies that are based on domination and subjugation, and in fact, on the Machiavellian ideas of it is better to be feared than to be loved. This generates animosity from which the excesses of force sprouts and from which cries of discrimination and conscious and unconscious bias evolves, or from which we hear cries of, I'm treated differently. I did not get the promotion, the job, or access to capital because I look differently or I get a soft sell, I will review your matter, or I will look into it, or I was treated with excessive force, <clears throat> though I was in full and proper compliance. Friends, we need policing, because it gives us the peace of mind and confidence to walk late at night, to transact, to build capital, and to feel free. However, we must develop a system that promotes humanity and love, that focuses on de-escalation and dialogue, rather than violent outbursts of unnecessary force that ends up with lives lost. Policing must police itself, be conscionable and stay within its contract and society to be fair and free from bias. It is the only way to retain legitimacy. Additionally, structural racism in education, in health, in employment, the criminal justice system, housing, and in municipalities and legislatures must be addressed in a large way. Permits to build temples and places of worship in minority communities must be a fair process. Our mayor in London made this happen with his intervention for us, and for that we will always be grateful. However, in Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo, we have had land for 25 years, but have been precluded from building our temples. These, this is very difficult. There must be diversity in policing and presence of diversity in centers of power within the bureaucracy so that not only is there a perception of, but a reality of fairness, equity, and justice. Bureaucratic systems that perpetuate embedded cultures of systematic racism must be dismantled with a new world model implemented based on common understanding, love, and humanity. If we move away from fear and insecurity, we can find love, and love can show us a new way. Let out your love. Reach out to another person different from you, and with sincerity, let them know that you love them. Spread love, and let the spread of love stop hate. My dear friends, may you all find peace and love, and may we have an end to the difficulties that we are facing as a human race. Thank you. God bless. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace. Um, and so it falls upon me to bring us uh, to a closing prayer. And I want to just uh, reflect um, on, uh, on the words that all of you have shared, really, and to give thanks for the combined wisdom of this group. But most especially tonight, uh, to offer our thanks uh, to those who are um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color who here have spoken. Uh, and those who have spoken um, at our uh, rally on our uh, protest on Saturday, those uh, in our lives who we know who are crying out for healing uh, for us to get it right. And um, 
I want to thank all of you who've spoken. I want to express our gratitude to Mark Smith, uh, who you heard at the beginning of tonight's broadcast, uh, for his lovely gift of music. Uh, you will hear him again at the close of this. Uh, Mark is the uh, music director of Riverside United Church and uh, does an incredible amount of work with community choirs in this city. And we're most grateful for his gift of music and his willingness to share uh, his vulnerability through that beautiful gift. So I want us to close with, uh, with this prayer, which uh, was written by Jennifer Jansen Ball, and it is a prayer of contrition. Um, I'm cognizant of my position here as a, um, a white, uh, married, straight uh, man, and the privilege that goes with that. And I realize, and part of what's happening in this time is a, a, a grand what the church might say is an apocalyptic time. The veil is being ripped back and we're beginning to see many things that make us uncomfortable. And uh, the temptation is to turn away. But God is calling us to look straight into that discomfort and the uncomfortable truths that come with it so that we might take ownership, as we've heard, to do the work necessary to mend uh, relationships and to bring healing and justice for all people. O God of the exodus, of liberation and new life, we come to you in prayer, naming the old things to which we cling. Stereotypes based on race, unearned privileges that are ours because of gender or skin color, unwillingness to speak out against racism and all that diminishes other human beings, internalized racism that keeps us from acknowledging our cultural and ethnic gifts. O oh God, we confess our complicity in racism, whether we participate intentionally or not. We live in societies, institutions, and churches built on structures that privilege one group over the others. The word racism is difficult for us to hear. It is difficult for us to speak. Open our eyes so that we might understand this that we might understand that this is not your desire for us. It is not your vision for us. Creator, we come with contrite hearts, longing to have new hearts created within us, seeking the waters of righteousness that will overturn injustice and create a new ways of living faithfully together that honor the dignity of every human being. We long for right relationships, O oh God, for abundance of life, for flourishing within you. In your grace, heal and transform us, heal and transform our institutions, that the beauty and the diversity of humanity may be fully reflected, gloriously alive in you. In all things we pray, through the one who was fully human and fully divine, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. And these words of assurance as we close. Hear the good news. God's gift of grace is available to all of us. God's gift of grace forgives us and sets us free to live full human lives in community with one another. May we go forth confident of the grace to see with new eyes beyond racial prejudice, to imagine with renewed fervor justice and mercy for all, and to hold fast to what we heard here tonight, that this is not a one-time event, but the beginning of a long process of dialogue, conversation, listening, learning, conversion, and action. Give us what we need to create. Give us what we need to will a new community where all are given access to God's abundance life, abundant life. We ask these things in the name of God. Amen. Again, I offer my gratitude to all of you, uh, to our musician, Mark, to all of you who've tuned in tonight across the Forest City for our event, Standing on the Side of Love, a call from all of us, from many faiths, uh, for people across the city to stand in solidarity with Black, Indigenous, and persons of color to say that we need to all take ownership now and make change as we go forward. Perhaps we will see you again sometime soon. We're back sooner than we thought this time. Uh, we give thanks uh, to uh, the mayor 
uh, to Counselor Cuyabaga, uh, to you, Pastor Junior, uh, for bringing the reflections that you brought tonight. And may we go in peace and know that God goes with us. Amen.